I want to record the fact that Bob Linson, our alumni director, and some others uh, picked up this notion about a commencement seminar with the feeling that the alumni of a college uh, deserved uh, a little more than nostalgia when they returned uh, for commencement, and homecoming, and other activities. Alumni activities have in the past been associated with looking backward and uh, frivolity. This newer concept of getting behind or beyond or around the sheepskin curtain is an idea that a college is a place where one can always learn something. A college is a place uh, where one cannot learn all there is to know in four years. We would hope that people would come back to colleges, people would come back to their alma maters year after year and learn some new things. Last year, we had the feeling this worked very well when we had Dr. La Follette take us on a tour of international education, when we had Dr. Cooper bringing us up to date in the field of science, when we had Dean Neuer stretching our minds for us in his inimitable style. And this morning, I think those of you who were there will agree with me, uh, we had an opportunity to have some of our ideas about teaching challenged when uh, Dr. Jeep told us some things, uh, some of which you believed and some of which you didn't believe. I think this afternoon, as the committee felt was peculiarly fitting in view of the fact that the dedication of the English building will follow this program, the committee invited Dr. Paul Royalty, head of the English department, uh, to address this portion of the seminar. The word seminar was selected carefully, uh, for this is not only the presentation of a paper but I hope a provocative statement which will encourage questions from the audience. And if we have our signals all straight, and Dr. Royalty will, after his remarks, be happy to answer questions, and we can continue our discussion until about 3.30, at which time, if you follow your paper, uh, we will move into the dedication of the English building. It's with a great deal of pleasure that I present our speaker at this time, Dr. Paul Royalty. Dean Burkhardt, President and Mrs. Emmons, members of the board, fellow teachers, and fellow students all. Before I read my paper, I'd like to extemporize for a few minutes concerning some matters that I think are pertinent, but which I did not care to include in the paper. First, I will discuss a matter of the complexity that results when many factors are mixed variously. Secondly, I will try to identify for you the nature and the purpose of art, big subjects, of course, to handle in a very few minutes. And third, I will define the limits of my paper. I begin by telling you a little story. It's a pertinent story. It isn't a funny story. <clears throat> Some years ago, a mathematician whom I know solved a problem by methods and formulae which an English teacher is not supposed to know. The problem is as follows. A wholly imaginary monkey is given a hypothetical name of ten letters. He doesn't know his name. He doesn't know how to spell, and he can't type. Nevertheless, they put him to a typewriter and require that he type his name. The problem was to determine what the chances are or were that he would type his name the first time he tapped ten letters on the, on the typewriter. The figure is almost unbelievable, astronomical, and for a reason that I will give you in a minute. The 
next part of that story, well, let me also mention, though, the fact that certain other mathematicians have figured the chances of certain combinations of cards being dealt are acquired in a bridge game or a poker game or what other kind of game may occur to you. For example, what are the chances that if you were playing bridge with a normally shuffled deck, that you would get, say, all the spades in one dealing of the cards? The mathematicians have figured it out. Something like five or six or seven or eight, I think it's eight million or billion. I didn't look it up. I remember reading the story. But it too is, astrono the figure is astronomical. Now the other consideration that I want to offer to you is a far more complex one. What are the chances that two individuals in the world will be totally alike? And of course the answer to that, I did put down a quotation from Sherlock Holmes, if I can find it. No figure, my dear Watson, can express it. As a matter of fact, of course, it's an utter impossibility because the human being is the total of all his potentiality plus all the experiences to which he's exposed from conception to his death. So the possibility of two individuals being totally alike is simply a, one that we cannot contemplate. And yet that's what society is made up of, persons totally different from each other. And the complete complexity of their beings. Now I come to a definition of the nature and the purpose of art. I've written as a part of an informal statement, the function of the arts, and therefore of literature, is to interpret life and to represent it with all its complexity in pleasing and permanent form. And that, of course, is a big assignment. And yet, it is the assignment. Man must, as I will say later in my paper, know himself in all his complexity. Art is conception expressed in such symbols and patterns which might be defined as discipline as to achieve a desired effect. Let's look once more then. The purpose of literature is to interpret life in all of its complexity and to represent it in pleasing and permanent form. Art is conception, expressed in such symbols and patterns or forms as to achieve a desired effect. That's the reason, by the way, that the so-called school of seat-of-the-pants painting cannot produce great art. That is, you can't smear paint on the seat of your pants and scoot around over a canvas and come out with meaningful and great art. You may come out with a pleasing combination of colors, but there's little conception behind. <laughs> Pardon the pun, I didn't anticipate it. <laughs> there's very little conception behind such a performance, and there'll be very little <laughs> achievement in such performance. Now I come also to the examination of what experience is of what kind of experiences we have. Experiences are of two kinds that are frequently talked about. Then I think experience certainly is of a third kind. The first kind of experience concerning which we hear a great deal, of course, is called primary or first-hand experience. The experience of the person in his 
ordinary affairs of life. The second kind of experience is called vicarious. It's the kind of experience we get from others in their books, in their paintings, in their sculpture, in the dance, any form of art. And that's the one we speak of usually when we're talking of art. We speak of experience achieved vicariously, the experiences that we could not otherwise have, the experiences of other minds and souls, which I will mention also a little later in the paper. And although I've never heard this greatly supported, I'm sure it can be supported, I think there's a third kind called conceptual. That's the stuff of imagination or the creative process. In other words, what people can conceive, putting two, to, two together of the other two and getting more than four. I think you have to believe in that. If you believe in man as an ongoing institution, if you please. If you consider that man is more than he once was in the dim past, in the, in the shadowland of his existence. <clears throat> it's through conceptive, uh, conceptual experience that new sensitivities, new insights, Actually, new experiences are provided for men so that they may, may become more sensitive, more wise, and if you'll pardon, more good, better. <clears throat> My topic, of course, is much too broad. We might spend our hour and a half on one novel of Tolstoy or Mann. We might spend our hour and a half on one poem by Auden or Eliot or Hart Crane. I've chosen, therefore, merely to introduce the subject. Why read great books? By speaking, of course, in general terms. I suppose I might say my purpose is to reaffirm for like-minded people the things that we already know to be true, rather than try to present something new, something fresh. <clears throat> All round the room my silent servants wait. My friends in every season, bright and dim, angels and seraphim, come down and murmur to me, sweet and low, and spirits of the skies all come and go, early and late. Books will not literally bring angels and seraphim into our rooms, nor devils and evil spirits either, for that matter. We have become too sophisticated and scientific to believe in the physical reality of such benignancies and horrors. But more truly wonderful, more real than such as these, are the creations of our miraculous minds. What man can conceive is already a part of him, for he is not flesh alone. What he can express is real and abiding and can be shared. From time to time I shall stop to speak just a little further on certain points, and I would like to do that here on that one point to enforce what I said before. What man can conceive, actually what he can imagine creatively, he already has become. Before books were made, there was a true darkness upon the face of the earth. It was indeed a void, approximately one and one-third million times as long as, as has been the period of recorded history. Man in recognizable human form has existed a thousand times as long as is his articulate record of his being. When he learned to write, he took more than a single giant bound toward a civilized state. Written language became a tool for thought and the systematizing of thought. Perhaps more important, it became the means of recording and disseminating thought. 
so that every gain could be added to every previous gain. The poet Dunn's saying that no man is an island entire into itself was never so true until men of genius were able to pyramid the significant creations of their minds and souls so that others might experience through and profit by them without labor and the, and the pain of creation, which to many, nations as well as individuals, would be an impossibility. At first glance, it would seem that science particularly, that in science particularly, the pyramiding of gain has brought advance, advance as spectacular and emancipating as that which results when a rocket es escapes the pull of gravity and achieves free flight in space. The knowledge of the physical universe upon which almost every aspect of modern life is based is so different from that upon which ancient cultures were founded as to be almost antithetical. Man has learned more about the anatomy of nature in the last two or three generations than he did in the, old, in the whole of his earlier existence, and so has been able, even compelled, to revol revolutionize the patterns of his life. This has come about because, bit by bit, in a permanent record, a gifted and dedicated few have inscribed their new knowledge and so have been able to share it with like-minded individuals and ultimately to pass on to the vaguely comprehending many the manifest fruits of their vision and labor. The physical universe has not essentially changed only man's knowledge of it, and his knowledge has, been a, has had a rich and recent fruition. Essentially, man's knowledge of himself parallels that of the physical world. Basically, he has changed little, human-wise, in the last three or four thousand years. And one would be rash who maintained that the ancient Egyptians, Hebrews, Greeks, and Romans were less, were less gifted of mind, less great of soul, than our men today. A civilization, and therefore the stature of its people, must ultimately be measured by its, re by its representation of itself through its arts. The Bible is still the great literary masterpiece of the Western world. The Iliad and the Odyssey are unmatched examples of epic poetry. Plato and Aristotle are of such stature that after them no figure has thrown so long a shadow. Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides have been equaled but once in 2,500 years, if they've been equaled at all. These are well, but well-known examples. They are not contradictions of the thesis that after books were made, man quickly broke the shackles of ignorance. They but prove it. After man learned to write, his first great achievement was not an accurate record of the world about him, but a penetrating and moving record of his own humanity. And the three, or f and the three thousand years or so in which he has accomplished this are but the re recent moments of his existence. Know thyself is an injunction that has been laid upon mankind, and the assignment is the most demanding that he, f that he faces. Far more complex, more mysterious than the appallingly complex physical universe is man himself. Within him is a physical universe miraculously ordered than are the earth which he inhabits and the galaxies of stars toward which he lifts his eyes. More complex than the fearsome atom, his brain is the absolute apex of the evolved universe. Man is physical, intellectual, aesthetic, moral. He reasons, remembers, wills. He loves, hates, believes. He sorrows, joys, aspires. Unique, a creature of sensibility and love in a universe that is largely mechanistic and brutal, he must understand himself as well as the forms and forces that surround him if he is to survive. He must always labor to improve himself if he is to experience the wonderful potential of life with which he is already possessed. If in seeking to know himself, to understand the reasons for and processes of his being, I'm sorry, it is in seeking to know himself, to understand the reasons for and processes of, processes of his being, that he differs from other creatures and things. Others feed their bodies and perpetuate their kind. Some have greater strength than he, some greater grace and beauty. But only man has a logical and creative mind wherewith to understand and plan and so to better and enrich his life. It is his true divinity. 
Yet this very complexity can be his undoing. The individual would be particularly helpless, who had to depend upon his own gifts and his first-hand experiences. His life is too short. His energy is too limited. The barriers of space are too great for him to see and touch much of the life that could instruct and enrich him. Einstein has written, Many times a day I realize how much my own outer and inner life is built upon the labors of my fellow men, both living and dead, and how earnestly I must exert myself in order to give in return as much as I have received. My peace of mind is often troubled by the depressing sense that I have borrowed too heavily from the work of other men. Fortunately for the individual, there are repositories in which are stored the winded kernels of the mind, the distilled essences of the heart. These always unlock storehouses or great books. The Greek critic Longinus has said that writing the great writing is the echo of, a great, echo of a great soul, and that only those who think greatly and feel deeply can write great books. Fortunately, again, there are persons ex of extraordinary gifts. The abyss between the extremes of humankind is so deep and so wide as to be immeasurable. In kind, the differences in worth between a great book, the difference in worth between a great book and a bad one is inexpressible. From time to time in eras, in fruitful eras, and at the crossroads of events, borrowing what, from what others have learned before them and creating freshly by their own genius, the sensitive and observing and great-souled have truly read and recorded the human heart and mind, immortalizing for all who would be profited the best that man has been able to express, to experience and to conceive and to express of beauty, justice, truth and love, which, as Socrates said, are the crown of life. Lest some think this estimate of books be sentimental and exaggerated, it might be well to review a few judgments that have long been accepted as just. Of poetry, first of poetry. Poetry is the record of the best and happiest moments of the happiest and best minds. A poem is the very image of life expressed in eternal truth. Now, most of you will, remember, will recognize that one. I'll identify them as I go along. That is the poet Shelley. Poetry is the music of the soul, and above all, of great and feeling souls. Voltaire. Poetry is the only verity, the expression of, sound, of a sound mind speaking after the ideal and not after the apparent. The, the true poem is the poet's mind, the finest poetry was first experienced. Emerson. Second of books in general. Books are the treasured wealth of the world and the fit inheritance of generations and nations. Thoreau. The man who adds the life of books to the actual life of every day lives the life of his whole race. The man without books lives the life of one individual. Bennett. In the best books, great men talk to us, give us their most precious thoughts, and pour their souls into ours. God be thanked for books. They are the voices of the distant and the dead, and make us heirs of the spiritual life of past ages. Books are the true levelers. They, go they give to all who will faithfully use them the society, the spiritual presence of the best and greatest of our race. If the sacred writers will enter and take up their abode under my roof, if Milton will cross my threshold and sing to me of paradise, and Shakespeare open to me the world of imagination and the workings of the human heart, and Franklin enrich me with his practical vision, wisdom it is, I shall not pine for want of intellectual companionship, and I may become a cultivated man, though excluded from what is called the best society in the place where I live. William Mallory Channing. The testimony is endless and convincing because the critical evaluation of books is of itself a great art, the expression of great minds. Socrates felt that the most profitable occupation of life is to examine by, con by is the examination by congenial-minded persons of the principles and the processes of the good life. He further held that the life which is not examined is not worth living. Converse with the good and the wise, he contemplated a descent into Hades, as did Homer, where, according to the Greek belief, 
Even the best souls had to reside after physical death, heaven being reserved for the gods only. Socrates says, if death is the journey to another place, and there, as men say, all the dead are, what good, O oh my friends and judges, can be greater than this? If indeed when the pilgrim arrives in the world below, he is delivered from the professors of justice in this world and finds the true judges who are said to give justice there, Minos and Radamanthus. Let's see, mark this one out. Eacus, I believe it is, and Triptolemus, and other sons of God who were righteous in their own life, that pilgrimage will be worth making. What would a man not give if he might converse with Orpheus and Musaeus and Hesoid and Homer? Nay, if this be true, let me die again and again. I too shall have a wonderful interest in a place where I shall converse with Palamedes and Ajax, the son of Telamon, and other heroes of old. Above all, I shall be able to continue my search into true and false knowledge. As in this world, so in that, I shall find out who is wise and who pretends to be wise and is not. What would not a man give, O judges, to be able to examine the leader of the great Trojan expedition, or Odysseus, or Sisyphus, or numberless others, men and women too? What infinite delight would there be in conversing with them and asking them questions? Here it seems is the ultimate question for this paper. What delight would there not be in conversing with the great, both living and dead? One of the two men who have most profoundly influenced Western culture thought the delight in the prophet so great as to be worth dying for, as indeed he did die for his convictions concerning the good life. There were few books available to him so, they could, so that he could only wish to converse with the numberless great. But for persons in this audience, there are no such restrictions. Books, the minds and souls of men, are literally numberless, and many generations and many cultures have added their great to the relatively few of whom Socrates was aware. The question then is purely one of inclination and choice. There are more worthwhile books than any one person could read if he did nothing but read throughout a long lifetime. One must choose, of course, to read, I'm sorry, one might choose, of course, to read solely in the area of his vocation. Another might stay within the limited field of interest, in a limited field of interest such as philosophy, biography, or history. But to share in the common heritage, to be able to communicate with civilized men and women regardless of nationality, color, or creed, a different kind of reading is necessary. The editors of the Golden Book magazine have said that the great books offer the greatest wisdom, the deepest understanding, the highest and bravest flights of man's imagination, that they are the best stories, the most thrilling emotion, the most living characters, the utmost beauty that man has been able to, to create. Let the student fix these definitions in his mind. Let him ponder their meaning, and he will have a working index by which to guide his reading though he must understand that he will mature as a reader only as he achieves an intimate and continuing acquaintance with the unquestionably great books. Now, I plan to repeat that definition. I'm going to do so here. The great books offer the greatest wisdom, the deepest understanding, the highest and bravest flights of man's imagination. It's that creative imagination that I spoke of a minute ago. They are the best stories the most thrilling emotion, the most living characters, the utmost beauty that man has been able to create. I find that a very handy measure for the great books. <clears throat> Choose those that please all and always, that have universal appeal, Longinus has told us. And of course by that he meant the discriminating all, that is, people in whatever land, Choose the books that please all and always. Matthew Arnold says to become thoroughly imbued with the unquestioned great, the best that has been thought and felt, and to let these become touchstones against which to measure the new and unproved. Aristotle has been more specific. Using the word poetry, or as it was early translated, poet, poesy, to mean belle lettre, that is the literature regarded as fine art or a product of the, of the creative imagination, 
he ascribes to it the highest place. Only the poet, he says, can utter the ultimate truth of life because only he is free to represent life in its universal aspects, free from the accidents and distortions of fact and individualist instance. Comparing poetry to history, he says, poetry therefore is a more philosophical and a higher thing than history. For poetry tends to express the universal, history the particular. By the universal I mean how a person of a certain type will on occasion speak or act according to the law of probability or necessity. Robert Louis Stevenson spoke in the same vein, and in his case also, one must redefine and broaden his term. He wrote, the most influential books and the truest in their influence, they do not teach him a lesson which you must afterward unlearn. They repeat, they rearrange, they clarify the lessons of life. They disengage us from ourselves. They constrain us to the acquaintance of others. And they show us the web of experience, not as we can see it for ourselves, but with a singular change, that monstrous consuming ego of ours being for the nonce struck out. Proof that he meant by fiction imaginative, that is, creative works of whatever kind, and not just novels, is his appended list, which includes Hamlet, As You Like It, Pilgrim's Progress, St. Matthew of the New Testament, Leaves of Grass, Walden, The Egoist, and Hazlitt's Essay. The choice, then, is a wide one. But for this audience, already initiate into the fraternity of thoughtful readers, it is, possibly, it is possible to do some further selection, to suggest some of the books that can be read over and over again with ever greater profit and continuing delight. To identify, to identify those books that can never be written again, and the loss of which, and indeed the neglect of which, would make us all poor. Great literature comes about as a result of the fortuitous flowing together of many factors and conditions. Creation of the literatures of the Old Testament, for example, required the existence of a gifted and sensitive people commingling with the significant mingling with and significantly affected by the cultures and the affairs of their time. And the time had to be a time of thought and stir, and the people had to be ripe for the time. They had to have a versatile and expressive language, capable of poetic utterance. They had to labor and suffer and fear, and yet they had to have an abiding, unsophisticated belief so that they could joy in and affirm the beauties of nature, their own humanity and the omnipotent love of God. The Iliad and the Odyssey are a product and a representation of the whole experience of a whole gifted race, likewise situated as time and place, and likewise ready in language, energy, imagination, and belief. And if I may extemporize again, I would point out the same thing is true of Renaissance England. It's said that at that time the English energy was, 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 and, and daring were at their height, that their language at, was at its fluid best. And if you want to read a most interesting short book or long essay, read John Livingston Lowe's work entitled The Noblest Monument of English Pro of the Noblest Mon Monument of English Prose, I believe is the exact title. And in that he points out the similarity of the expediency, the similarity of the of the mind, the similarities of the languages of the ancient Hebrews and of Elizabeth in England. That is a language alive, free, full of symbols. Any list of the great books will begin with the Bible and will include the other religio folk literatures called epics that gather, distill, and preserve in beautiful and passionate utterance the experiences of sensitive and gifted races. The literary ep epics differ only in that they have single authorship. The theme and the manner are the same. Invariably listed are the Bible, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Nibelungen Lied, the Mahabharata, the Song of Roland, the Aeneid, the Divine Comedy, and Paradise Lost. If anyone in the audience objects to the Bible being called epic and folk, I call your attention to the fact that all great epics 
All the great early folk material was religious. The Bible is a religious book, of course, but it's epic in its manner, in its high seriousness, in its simplicity, it's epic in its derivation, and that it comes from folk. It's a representation of a great people and a great culture. Truly to know the people who created these deathless works, to understand his own heritage and to speak the language of civilized man, one must have read and reread these books. Moreover, he will delight in doing so. They are not difficult and tedious. On the contrary, they are for the most part directly and simply told, and they are thrillingly interesting. And I would be happy in the time we have left after to discuss with you why the epics in a little more detail why the epics are great and perhaps why they are dead, that is, dead in the fact that they'll never appear again. We probably will never have, have epic literature produced again. One critic has said that man's greatest, most abiding achievement on this earth is tragic drama. I move on to another form, you see, in blank verse. The pyramids have been sacked and are crumbling. The Chinese wall has been breached. Political and economic dynasties are as shifting as the sand, but the dramas of Aeschylus will endure and remain as long as mankind keeps the mind and soul, mind and soul to cherish them. Aristotle thought that the epic and the drama were the highest forms of art. In scope and high seriousness, he gave first place to the epic. In intensity and in form, he gave it to the drama. By its very device of setting and costume, of pantomime and dance, of lyric speech and song, of opposing character to character in tragic conflict, the drama is the most, uh, most versatile and realistic of the literary form. Aristotle says of tragedy that it is a representation of life. Some of the books use the word imitation. A representation of life, an imitation of an action that is serious and complete, of a certain magnitude, that through its action and its language it creates in the beholder, the soul-purging, soul-strengthening emotions of pity and fear. Relatively speaking, there have been only three great periods of drama writing, the classical, the Renaissance, and the modern. Actually, the Greeks, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, and the British Shakespeare stand alone. Of course, there are many more works. There are many more whose works will be must on anyone's list. A few that come to mind are Aristophanes, Seneca, and Plautus, Moliere and Cornier, Moliere and, or Marlowe and Johnson, Goethe and Suderman, Ibsen and Strindberg, D'Annunzio and Pirandello, Chekhov and Gorky, Shaw, Goldsworthy, Yeats and O'Casey, Wilder and O'Neill, to group them more or less by nationality. The novel is a relative newcomer, though it has its roots in very ancient form. It's my belief that the novel probably is and will become the, great, the nearest approach to the epic. Today, it is the most seriously practiced of, practice of the literary arts of wide scope. It has developed a tremendous versatility as to theme, temper, length, and form. It may be historical, political, psychological, romantic, realistic, allegorical, of epic length and scope, treating of a whole race or culture, are of drama length and structure, treating, ostensibly, one day's experience of an ordinary Irish citizen, or even the struggle between an old man and a great fish. It can be as carefully structured as is a classical play. It could be made up of loosely strung episodes, or it can trace the tightly related but seemingly formless meanderings of the subconscious mind. One scarcely knows how to choose. Perhaps one needs first to check the list of common denominators in the form, which he knows he should have read long ago, but for which he somehow has never found the time or the occasion. These are great books, greater in their common humanity and universal appeal. They must not be missed. Perhaps to suggest a few will su suffice. There are Pride and Prejudice, Ivanhoe, David Copperfield, Silas Marnin, Vanity Fair, Jane Eyre, The Vicar of Wakefield, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, 
the Cloyston Heart, and their Huckleberry Finn, the Deerslayer, Tom Sawyer, the Scarlet Letter, Les Miserables, the Three Musketeers. I mention these only because my, stu my students come into my reading seminar and they say, now, would you mind if I read Ivanhoe? I'm ashamed of the fact that I haven't read it before. I know I should have read it, but may I read it in this seminar? And I say, yes, read it. It's late, but it's not too late. These are but a few. One will have, to re one will have read most of them. Finally, one will go on to a less familiar. A pattern seems to have been established in selecting great novels to limit the number to 25. There follows something more than 25 titles, including, excluding, the 15 just read. Eugenie Grande, Pierre Goriot, Wuthering Heights, Pilgrim's Progress, Lord Jim, The Brothers Karamazov, Crime and Punishment, Adam Bede, Tom Jones, Madame Bovary, The Foresight Saga, The Growth of the Soil, Return of the Natives, Don Quixote, Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship, Ulysses, Joseph in Egypt, The Magic Mountain, Moby Dick, Within a Budding Grove, All Quiet on the Western Front, The Red and the Black, Tristan Shandy, Anna Karenina, War and Peace, Fathers and Sons, Kristen Lovren's Daughter. These by no means make up a definitive list. If we would spend the rest of the day, we could discuss some of these. The short stories are not included in our list. Certainly the serious reader will not wish to exclude them, for in brief space and time they can, they can provide a wonderful reward. Likewise with lyric poetry, without which no reading plan would be complete. But the title of this paper is Why Read Great Books, and some kind of limit must be set. Of course, no reader will want to miss Plato and Aristotle. Herodotus, Herodotus and Tacitus, Lucretius and Marcus Aurelius, Horace and Chaucer and Spencer and Whitman. He will want to add them to the other immortals whose works will give him a lifetime of delight and link him to every like-minded soul, living and dead and yet to be born. All of the best books can be at his command. Why should he be satisfied with less? definition of great book. <clears throat> you have to go back to the earliest critics to get those definitions. To begin with, Plato felt they were inspired. <clears throat> you remember that he said the poet, and again the word was used to mean the the writer of literature as against the writer of philosophy and history and so forth. He said, when I was a little self-conscious about heaping so much praise upon great minds, <clears throat> he said, the poet is a winged and holy thing who sings by power divine. Then Aristotle went on to say, that great books are those that do examine life, represent it truly through action, the actions of men, and with such moving quality, quality as to strengthen the soul, to clarify the mind. You remember that. Uh, <clears throat> And then we go on, and for a long time there's a debate in criticism about, actual, about the actual purpose of great books. Whether in the first, well, first of all, I think criticism uh, divides itself into, in rather, it lays down two requirements that great books instruct 
in the broadest sense of the word instruct, that they give spirit, that they strengthen emotional nature rather than weaken it, that they instruct the mind, of course, but in the best sense, of course, uh, then, I think we're mistaken. Or rather, quote here, that the great books are those that do improve mankind. They instruct him. They instruct his, his mind. They strengthen his spirit. The other aspect of great books is that they please. Over and over, you see the two sides. That the great book is one that instructs and pleases. And then we go on and we find Longinus saying, as I indicated a minute ago, that a great book is one that, that is deathless, that not only will not be written again, but cannot be written again. It's unique. A thing like Moby Dick, for example, which nobody else could conceivably do at all. Or Shakespeare's plays. Or the epics that I mentioned a minute ago. The Bible will never be created again. It cannot be created again because it comes as an indigenous part of a racial experience. Oh, if you wanted me to tell you what a bad book is, of course I could tell you, and you know as well as I do, but it is a good point to, to develop here. Hmm. Um, Longinus also said, sounds very modern, also said that a book has to be universal, it has to be deathless. Now, I didn't say anything about form. I indicated I couldn't take up, obviously, uh, any critical aspect. I couldn't examine any work. But, uh, what, um, back again, what makes the Bible a great literary thing? Well, after all, these people without formal education were great souls. They had a lyricism that comes only from great feeling. They were unselfconscious. Great poetry somehow has, seems to develop. The greatest poetry seems to develop early in the cultures of nations, in, in culture, yes, in the lives of nations, in the lives of people. Sometime, somehow, when we become too learned, too rational, we write prose, not poetry. The great books have, repeating again the Golden Book's definition, the greatest wisdom, the deepest feeling, the most living character, the greatest beauty. Anybody want to change the subject? We do have a few minutes, yes, back there. Okay, so. You mentioned the fact that the 20th century would not have a great epic with right to tell us why. Yes. The very reasons that I've just mentioned for the most part. A people can't be self-conscious. There has to be a, a sort of naivete. There must be a great faith which a scientific age does not produce, at least universally in its people, to have an epic. An epic is a sort of soul cry of a deeply believing, a greatly suffering, a very lyrical people. And I don't believe the 20th century can produce one. Some, some race very closely united, uh, backward as far as science and sophistication is concerned, 
the Russians of the time of Tolstoy might have done it. And Tolstoy almost did it, you see, in an epical uh, work of prose, a sort of prose epic, War and Peace. But they couldn't do it now. Yes. Well, now that you mentioned Russia, have you had time to read Dr. Bravo? Do you think it's worth the Nobel Prize? I have not completed it. My wife did. She had it at home at that particular time. I happen to be, of course, very enthusiastic about the early Russian literature. I think in any ten great uh, writers. Uh, writers of novels, at least three of them have to be Russian. I heard Professor Birnbaum of the University of Illinois say that any, of any 25 great writers, 10 of them have to be the Russians of that period. And of course, in a fashion, they bear out what had been stated. There was, there was a time of, of great feeling. There was a time of suffering. There was a time of great concern. There was a time of high idealism. Unhappily, it's the men of goodwill, great minds and great souls. Happily, they write. I started to say unhappily it is, and I, I will finish that, that statement in that fashion. Unhappily, after, we'll put it that way, men of great minds and souls do create the idealism. They stir. Then men of bad will and great power, ruthlessness, seem to carry out the improvement, the revolution that should follow it. Uh, I had no time, of course, to identify any of the writers or to include as many as I wanted to. I think the nearest thing to that in spirit, in scope, in depth, in lyricism, in naivete that we have is, uh, is Scandinavian. I love the Scandinavian writers. Of course, the French do a completely different thing. They will, they will write greatly, but they do it somehow as their painters paint. They create the reality, the image, which, you, which they don't describe, they don't discuss, they merely they merely put it on the canvas. You, you live it. You're likely to wonder what they're doing until you become well acquainted with it. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Where was the question? I didn't see it. I'm not Wait. sure how to fit into the subject, but where does the evidence form of this great book to uh, have it mentioned in the Golden uh, Book Company? fit into this picture for our children. The, I didn't understand. The edited form of the great book. Oh, you mean the... the, the uh, sense of the Golden Book and some of the other... Well, the Golden Book, the Golden book for list. Children. Let me tell you about the Golden Book, then I'll come back. How many know the Golden Book magazine? It was published beginning back in the 20s and ending somewhere in the early 30s. It was a magazine edited by some critics and college professors. And I believe it had a few creative writers back of it, too. And its purpose was to bring to the general reader a number of things that were not available at that time in translated form and was readily available to children and in libraries and so forth. In the May issue of 1930, they published a list called All oh, the Hundred Great Books. And they said, in essence, what I said here that to join the list of educated men the world over, to be able to speak the language of educated men, these were the books you'd have to read. Not necessarily the books you'd take to a desert island, because if you went to a desert island, you might want a book on how to raise turnips, or something about making a raft, or uh, reading the stars, something of that kind. But they did list the hundred books which they felt expressed the, well, the continuing humanity of 
the species. Now, as I gather, as I caught your question, you're asking, uh, is it good to edit these books? Is it good to give them in condensed form? Well, I'll have to be honest with you. We were quite willing for our youngsters to read comics and Dave Dawson and, and Scout books and anything else to get them to read. It's my opinion that reading is learned first as a skill. You learn to read. It's a little hot up here when you're working. <clears throat> as, as a sort of chore, something you have to learn to do. Then you develop reading as a as a habit, as a pleasure, as a way of spending your time, as a way of entertainment, as a medium of delight. And finally, you learn to be, you read for discrimination. That is, you learn to judge. Now, I don't know what experience, although I've worked with teachers, and what experience teachers have with youngsters reading the synthesized or what do you call that, watered down version. But I think I just assume youngsters would read according to their age and their interests and so forth and wait until they're ready for the great books and then read them, for goodness sake. Read them in their virginity. I hate to have spoiled the great books, Shakespeare or Tolstoy or anybody else. By thin version, adulterated version. Now, of course, people do say to me, people that come to my classes do say to me, yes, but what if they never read them? Well, if they never read them, they never read them. If they, if they read them in the easy editions, they haven't read them. That's what I mean, you see. It's not the story, for goodness sake. Lamb's tales from Shakespeare don't do you any good. Have any reward for a mature person? Yes. And I tell you my own experience with um, uh, Sinopsky. I was a young fella. I wanted quick culture. I got a hold of one of these books of synopses, the 200 great books of the world in tablet form. I read the first one and I remembered it very well. I thought, this is, this is fine. I can talk about this book now anytime I want to with anybody. I read two and I could remember two. But when I'd read ten, I couldn't remember any of them, so I threw them all away. <clears throat> I have one uh, interesting humorous anecdote to tell you about a, a well-known man with whom I was associated in school one time. <clears throat> it was a military school, and he had come up through the ranks from sergeant. <clears throat> he hadn't read much, and he didn't have time to read. I was coaching basketball at the time, and we went into Chicago and on to one of the other military schools to play a game. We put up in a hotel and he and I roomed together because he was the discipline officer, the public relations officer, or as I was the coach. We got in our respective beds and he reached over <laughs> into his suitcase and first of all got out a clock and he set it. Then he reached in and got a little book and I peered and it said, The Wisdom of the World. Oh, I've gotten out. It was the scribe, Bill. Anyhow, I had to read it 15 minutes a day, and the man set the clock for 15 minutes and read, and when the alarm went off, he, he closed the book, shut off the... the uh, <laughs> I tell you it was, but the old gentleman's still living, and I love him, and I, I, I wouldn't uh, betray him any further than I have. Well, I suspect enough unless there is really a question. There's been a very fine audience. This is the kind of an audience I like to talk to, to the high school group. I got out there and they had an auditorium and they're two and three to the seat and the principal came up and said, I thought you wouldn't mind if we just brought up all the grade school youngsters too. 
and that's a fine speech I gave them, <coughs> adjusting to that, that audience. You're the kind of an audience I like to speak to. <laughs> <laughs>